You're watching Pegarai TV, Rhode Island's public access channel. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to another edition of An Hour with Bob on this August 1st afternoon. We're taping some shows in the afternoon now, if you may have figured that out, and some shows at night, depending on my guests. <laughs> and today's guest, I have the current, the new Attorney General. Thanks, Bob. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing great. Good to see you. Thanks nice for Nice to me see on. you. Doesn't feel Peter Narona, by the way. Huh? Doesn't feel as new as it did in January, but uh, yeah, relatively new, I guess. Now that we're here in August. But I mean, you got. I, I was thinking about this when I was ha having uh, ha about to have you on. I'm thinking about while well, I was working in the lieutenant governor's office, I ran into you many times, sure, at different all kinds of events. But a lot of people don't know you, mm -hmm. know you, know you. Mm -hmm. You know, know. Uh, yeah. As I just found out that sure. you, you, you were brought up and born and bred in uh, Jamestown, Rhode yeah. Island. I am, yeah. And your fa your father too. Yeah. So uh, my father, uh, my and grand your grandfather when he started there when he was three, good three, over there, yeah, three so, years old. So on my dad's side, I'm Portuguese from the Azores, and my great grandfather came over from the Azores. My went to Portsmouth, and then very quickly moved to Jamestown when my, my grandfather was three. My dad was born there. He's one of the few kids that was born actually on the island. There was a little birthing hospital there across from the Bay Voyage. There, wait a minute. There was absolutely actually a hospital? On there was. Yeah, it was called the Bates Sanatorium. So people would go there and take the waters, and they, they delivered kids there. It's right across oh. from where the Bay Voyage is today. Yeah, I know where that is. Yeah, yeah right, right across the street. And so actually the, the Historical Society in Jamestown just did a gathering of like six or seven kids from now you know, elderly, older people. Wow. <laughs> Including my dad who's still alive but born there. Yeah, so my dad was born there, and I was raised there. Shelly and I, my wife and I, raised our two sons there. So we, we go back quite a bit. My dad, my grandfather worked on the ferry boats uh, when they were still running. My dad worked at the bridge after that. What do they call that? Uh, it's not Connecticut. It's um, uh, what do they call that? The well, it's Connecticut Island. Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut yeah Connecticut but it's Jamestown. It's the same thing. So they worked on the ferries to Newport, although my grandfather worked on the ferries between Jamestown and the mainland. So he, he was working wow. on those ferries in the 30s before the Jamestown Bridge was built. So, Holy cow. Yeah, that's a little bit of the family history. My mother's an immigrant from Germany. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's an interesting uh, family Dynamic. Mix. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But in your, in your grandfather was there at three, from the time he was three? Yes, yeah, yeah. And wow. spent all of his life working on the ferry boats. When he, came, but, uh, when he became an adult, he went to work on the ferries. He was there during the 38 hurricane. Um, and his car got washed off the pier at West Ferry, and uh, he retired from the ferries in 1969. So he spent over 30 years of his life working on those ferries every wow. day. Wow, that's a, that's interesting. Yeah, it's great. It's a great part of Jamestown history. You know, the, the 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 people who've been there a long time have fond memories of those ferry days. You know, it was a different kind of place then. Oh yeah, of course it was. It, it wasn't was a stepping stone to Newport. It, right, it had right. its own it, culture. Its it own, wasn't a pass own, through. It wasn't. Yeah, it was a place where people mostly worked and and lived and. Uh, and they stayed there. And they stayed there. Yeah, yeah. And they had a school. Now you went to school. I did. I went K through eight through Jamestown, and then high school. I they went don't. Have, they still don't have a high school. There. We don't. Yeah. So you go to North Kingston High School. My dad went to Rogers because back in the day you went to Newport if you were a Jamestown kid. And then it changed to North Kingstown. Now, interestingly enough, you can also go to Narragansett. I was going to say that. Don't they have an option? They do now. Yeah. The, my my young my youngest boy went to North Kingstown, but now you have an option. You can pick Narragansett or North Kingstown. North Kingstown's bigger. Narragansett's smaller. So I think parents probably choose based on what they think is best for their child. Nice right. to have, nice option to have. It is, it is. And it's a, uh, another reason why your taxes are lower than 
some our taxes, yeah, our taxes are pretty low. Yeah, no they high are. school, <laughs> no high school. Yeah, <laughs> we pay by the child, and there aren't, you know, frankly, there aren't a ton of kids. I think my eldest son's class was between forty and fifty kids, and my That's youngest it? one's sixty. In theory, going to high school, coming out of eighth grade, right. but not all of them go to the public schools. Sure. And so, when you're paying by student, yeah, it's it's not that expensive. And Jamestown's a great place to live. It's wonderful. I love it. Right. There. Yeah. Yeah, a little slow for me, but uh, growing, yeah, well, growing up yeah, in Pawtucket, yeah, kid, you yeah, know, right. I, I couldn't handle like, that. I mean, if you like the city, <laughs> yeah, in the, in the winter it gets slow in particular. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. I like that. Yeah, I like the quiet, particularly given what I do, Bob. You know, it's I described it once. You kind of, sometimes you feel like you're the you're the lamp, and uh, everything is coming to the to the light. You know, uh, particularly when I was on the line as a prosecutor in Court of Nine in Providence with uh, then Attorney General, uh, former Attorney General Patrick Lynch. Patrick Lynch and I were in the in the AG's office together as, right. as run, you know, line prosecutors, and we had this very busy courtroom together. By the end of the day, you had dealt with so many people in so many cases. You want to be away from Yeah, them. going home to Jamestown seemed like just the right antidote, yeah. All right, when you started, how did you, how did you start? Uh, you, you went to college where? Yes, yeah, so I went to Boston College, and then I went to Boston College Law School, and then after I graduated, I worked at a large Boston law firm. Uh, I was the first person in my family to go to college, and, uh, and law school. Yeah, yeah right, <laughs> and um, so, um, Fortunate that my parents supported that goal of mine, and um, but I had some student debt, like a lot of students do. Yeah. And so I took a job with a large Boston law firm that that uh, Goodwin Proctor is its name. It has today it has about 800 lawyers. Back then it had 300. It, it was wow. a really huge place in wow. downtown Boston. Learned a lot there. Um, got some of those loans paid off, and I met my wife, who's a primary care physician. She was doing her residency in in Boston at the time, and. I decided ultimately I wanted to be in a courtroom a little more, maybe do some public service, and so I applied to the uh, AG's office here, Attorney General's office, and was hired by Attorney General Pine, Jeff Pine, and then Shelley, my wife, and I moved to Jamestown home for me and uh, raised our raised our two boys eventually, and so I started in the AG's office in 1996. I became an assistant U.S. attorney, also went over to the federal side in 2002, right. and then in now what prompted that? You know. Um, well, I had the opportunity, and so I'd been working on a case um, that the federal government was prosecuting. So I was an assistant AG, but every, every once in a while the offices worked together. And so I was sent over to the U.S. Attorney's Office to work on the Lincoln Park bribery case or, or bribery conspiracy case. Lincoln Park? Yeah, so there was a case. Oh, okay. You're, okay. Yeah, it was okay. a case where there was a conspiracy by some um, executives in England to bribe the Speaker of the House. I remember that. So I went over to work on that case and uh, kind of got my foot in the door a little bit. And then when the job opening came, um, I decided to pursue it. And, and why? Um, the offices are different. Now I've been in both. I've been on the line in both, and I'm now I've been leading both the right. U.S. Attorney's Office and the AG's Office. And the missions are very different. And in the U.S. Attorney's Office, you, the caseloads are a little smaller. The cases tend to be a little more, not always, but a little more involved, involved and you can build it yourself. You know, you, a federal uh, law enforcement agency can't do anything unless an assistant U.S. attorney gives them the green light, unless a crime happens right in front of them. So what do I mean by that? So in the state system, a police department can investigate a burglary, a homicide, an embezzlement, work it all up, make an arrest, and then come to the AG's office and say, prosecute, please. Right. I don't think that's the way to do it. And I think in the best circumstances, we're working together from the beginning, but it can happen that way. In the federal system, if the prosecutor, assistant U.S. attorney doesn't say, okay, we're ready to go, then it doesn't go. And I think that builds a better case. So I like that part of it. Well, that's why they, they uh, prosecute, what, 97% of their... We have good success rate over there, but we're also picking and choosing as well. <laughs> the state, you kind of get everything. So, there, yeah, but I, I like that style of practice. And then in 2009, uh, when President Obama became uh, president, Senators Reid and White House recommended me to President Obama to be the U.S. Attorney. And so I took over the office and uh, kind of packed up my stuff and moved down the hall to the, to the slightly <laughs> bigger office. And then we were sort of off to the races at that point. Well... Well, it's a testament to you because I'm, I'm a political animal and uh, to know that uh, you ran unopposed. Well, I had an opponent, but I did not have a traditional opponent. I did not have yeah. a primary, Democratic well, primary. Well, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. I, 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 meant, I meant to say that. You didn't have a Democratic primary. And I didn't have a Republican in the general election. Right. I had a, sort of an independent, uh, independent opponent. But, but yeah, look, it, it, it was not a traditional campaign. Um, you know, I can't, I can't really get into the heads of others, but I felt like you know, coming out of the U.S. Attorney's Office and having had experience in the office, um, the Attorney General's office, and in the U.S. Attorney's office, and then in running one of those offices, that 
I had things to run on. And I will say, having been back in the office now for seven, eight months, it reminded me how difficult it is. And, and by the way, I love the job. But it is very difficult, I think, to do these jobs, whether it be U.S. Attorney or AG, if you don't have some baseline of experience. You can do it. Right. But, but it makes it a lot easier for me, having done the work, and frankly, having led the U.S. Attorney's Office. I mean, I've had to make the kind of decisions that you have to make, where sometimes the options are not always great. You're, you're choosing between A and B, and you wish you had C. C yeah. um, but you know, over time, you recognize that that's what you need to do, and you try to make the best call you can. And that's definitely been, having been U.S. Attorney for almost eight years, has definitely been a benefit to me as AG. No question about it. It would make it. sense. Now you, now, you mentioned about your, your college loan. Mm -hmm. What about this, the, the college loans that, you, that some of these candidates yeah. are talking about giving up? Yeah. Does it, does it even make any sense to you? You mean to, to, to eliminate college yeah. debt or make college free? You know? Yeah, now they're say, first of all, they're saying in Rhode Island there's, uh, what, $4.5 billion yeah, worth of college right. debt? There is, and yeah. And $470 million of it is delinquent? Mm -hmm. Now, you paid your college loan. I did. I, I did. paid my college loan. Mm -hmm. I did, You know, yeah. I can see maybe cutting mm -hmm. down the interest or something, sure. but I can't see eliminating them. Yeah, look, I think, I think it's a challenge for young people today. And I think when people ask me, you know, should I go to law school or not? And I get that a lot. I'm a lawyer. I went to law school, right? And I always ask them, you know, I love the law. I've been very lucky, though. I mean, I've, yeah. I've gotten, I've had great opportunities over the course of my, of my career to do great, fun, exciting things. But I, I say to them, young people, my own sons, although he was going to law school. Now you have uh, what, two sons? Two boys, yeah. One just graduated from college. One will be a sophomore this year. But what I tell young people is who ask me, have a plan, you know, don't go to law school today and not have a plan. The market is tough for lawyers. Right. I think if we're being honest, it's tough. There's right. a lot of lawyers out there. And, and not uh, only that, you can't just be a lawyer and make it as a lawyer. You've right. got to be a good lawyer. And, and you've got to be a businessman. And you've got to be a businessman. Right. And you've got to have charisma for the most, especially if you're going to be a trial lawyer. Or you do, kind. you do. And not, it's not, cut, not everybody's cut out for that. Now, my wife's a physician. She's a primary care physician. She hasn't taken a new patient in a long time because there are not, aren't enough doctors to service all the patients in the state of Rhode Island. Right. Um, that's not the case with lawyers. I mean, we have more lawyers. In, in Rhode Island, you have more lawyers than any other state. Yeah. And so, by the way, I graduated from Roger Williams, and, uh, the, the regular school, mm -hmm. and I was going to be a lawyer, but they had no law schools in Rhode Island right. at the time. So look, it's a great profession. I don't want to sound overly discouraging, but what I tell young people is have a plan. Kind of know what you want to do. Don't, particularly if you're going to run up a lot of debt you know, by, to pay for college. Make sure you have a means of paying that back. I was fortunate that I had a good job. I could do that pretty quickly. Um, my wife had some medical school debt, and so by the time I left Boston, we had both of those things taken care of, but I was very fortunate. And, you know, I have a son who's applying to med school and, and, and working with him to make sure that he has a plan as to how he'll right. take on that, that indebtedness or pay for medical school is important. I think every young person should be having that conversation. Yeah, it makes sense. But it's a great profession, and you can do a lot of, and you can do a lot of good with it. Lawyers can do a lot of good work with that, with, uh, with that degree. But, you know, like anything else, it's a, it's a decision you really have to think through before you go down that road, I think. Yeah, but um, if you pay it, I paid my debt off in seven years. It, you, know, you said you paid it yeah. off. Huh? Yeah, about seven, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, was it? Yeah. yeah, you know, look, I think it's, um, you know, I, 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 think it, I think it's difficult. I will say that I, I'm a big believer in the programs that, and I think we should encourage these programs. I was talking to a friend of mine today who has a son uh, in law school. And um, if you stay in public service, you only pay a certain percentage of your income. That makes sense to me, right? It does. It encourages public service. You have skin in the game. Right. Those programs make a lot of sense to me. I think, you know, I think to wipe out debt sort of as of now or tomorrow, I think that, that's kind of a tougher call, I think. Um, you know, where do you draw the line? How far back do you go? Um, right. I, I don't feel, I, it wouldn't offend me. I mean, I, you know, I was fortunate and able to do what I needed to do to, to get, to get that, that resolve paid off, but, but that's a complicated issue. I think, I think the other thing, too, is we want to encourage education, college education. Um, how do we do that in such a way that when you come out on the other side of college, that what you have is meaningful in terms of your employment prospects, um, and also you have an ability to pay for what it is you just bought? And there are, as, as was told to me when we were talking about this the other day, some uh, a couple of people actually brought it up about some some of these people go to college and with no intent of even uh, getting a degree, just for the hell of it to go to college, yeah. and have fun. 
Now we want to get rid of their debt. Well, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I ever experienced that. Although when I was in college, there were plenty of people around me having a lot of fun. I like to think I had a little fun <laughs> myself. But, um, but but you have to have a plan, I think, you know. And, and and that's not to say, look, there are lots of great jobs out there in the trades, for example, that are that don't necessarily require a college degree. Exactly. That pay a great wage. Oh God! Look are, at the plumbers are, and electricians. Sure, the money carpenters. They can make. You know, I've, I've worked. You know, worked with labor over the years, and and they do a great job. Bright people. You know, great craftsmanship. Our office in, in Providence is being renovated right now. I see the work going on with HVAC, electrical, right. carpentry. So you know, there's. You know, I think the key for a young person today, to the extent anybody's asking for my advice, uh, doesn't happen a lot, is is to have a plan as to what you want to do. And understand what the costs are as you execute execute that plan. But look, the economy's gotten a lot better over the last eight years. I remember, and I know this because we were trying to get when I was U.S. Attorney. One of our one of our main goals was to get people who were coming out of prison into the workforce, so that they wouldn't reoffend. Somebody who has come out of the prison and is back on their feet and has a job is much less likely to reoffend. And that was a very hard lift when I was U.S. Attorney, and the unemployment rate was 13 percent. Right. And so, like you know, look, it's hard for a Rhode Islander who doesn't have a criminal record to get a job in that environment, right? And let alone somebody who's got a got a you know criminal got record. a mock against them. Like Correct. That. Yeah. But now with the, with our unemployment rate much lower than that, at three, sure. four percent, whatever it is, at least the market is strong, and so that we've got a lot of work there still to do, um, but that overall picture is better, and that's encouraging. That's encouraging. All right, let's talk about uh, Louis Aponte. Sure. Sure. Now, he just got, would you call it a conviction? Uh, yeah, it's a felony conviction, it, yeah. He's yeah. convicted, but yes, yes. Uh, somebody questioned me, knowing that you were coming on the sure. show today, and they asked me, well, I asked him about how come he didn't, how come he was <laughs> yeah. so easy on him? I said, yes. I don't know that he was easy on him. Sure. I said, I'll ask yeah. him what sure. he thinks yeah. about that. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, we've done, you Louis know. Aponte, well, let's explain yeah, it. Yeah, let's explain who Louis Aponte is. Louis Aponte is a, was a Providence City Councilor until this week. He was a, wasn't he the president of the council? He was for a while. He had stepped down as, after he was indicted um, in, by Attorney General Kilmartin's Martin's office. Before I got there, he was the president. Then he stepped down upon his indictment. But he did not resign from the council. Right. And he was indicted in May of 2017, so over two years ago. And so he's been serving for all of this time. So he is a Providence City Councilor who stole money from his campaign account. So he raised money from donors and then used 13,000 13, plus, almost 14,000 dollars of that campaign money to pay for personal expenses. Right. Net Netflix, cable yeah. bills, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so what this case was, was a theft from a campaign account. And sometimes in the past that's been charged as a misdemeanor. Sometimes it's been charged as a felony. Right. It can be both. Um, there haven't been a ton of cases. In fact, there's only been two previously. Uh, well, how do you establish which way you go, felony yeah. or misdemeanor? Well, I think it should always be a felony. I think it should you be do. because I think when you're, I, and I'll tell you why. I think it should always be a felony for this reason. It should always be a felony because when you're living off your your camp your campaign funds, whether you, whether it, whether it's subconscious or not, or conscious, there's a possibility that you feel a certain. Well, how can it be subconscious? Well, well, let me, not that you're taking the money. The indebtedness you feel to your donors, right? So if you're if you're a politician, right, you need your donors to run a campaign, and we all know that. I do that. That's part of the game. But when you're relying on your donors to pay your monthly cable bill or your car payment or your mortgage, well, now you feel a sense of indebtedness, or potentially you do, in a way that you might not otherwise, right? It's one thing when you need donors to fund your campaign. It's something right. else when you need them to pay your mortgage, right? right? Or pay for your car. Oh, I get where you're you going know what I'm with saying? that. Yeah, I so do. So I don't know whether it's subconscious or conscious, but maybe you feel a loyalty to them. Right. Beyond more than, the, more than, more than you than normally typical. would. Yes. Correct. And in those circumstances, right, does that drive your official decision making? Okay. Okay. So that's to me, it's kind of a I don't want to call it a soft corruption, but it, it's it's not taking a bribe. We all know what that looks like. That's Gordon Fox, right. right? It's not the North Providence Town Councilman. We know what that is. That's taking a bribe. It's not Charles Moreau, the Mayor of Central Falls. All cases we did when I was U.S. Attorney. That's taking a bribe. This is something different. I think it's I think it's important. I think we have to prosecute it, but it it's different from taking a bribe. So you ask me, so. How do we handle those cases? Well, the first thing you do is you look at what have other people gotten in the past for doing exactly the same thing. Right. There are two examples. One is a state rep still in office, 2015, pled to a misdemeanor and remains in office. The other one is another rep who, who pled to a felony. Neither one of those two individuals went to jail. Right? In Rhode Island. In Rhode Island. Right. And so, so when you're putting a case together, 
and you go to court. We've charged it now. It's charged by Attorney General Kilmartin. Now you go to court, and what do you hear back from the defense attorney or the judge? Well, this guy got that, right. or that guy got this. And so if you're asking for more, you better have a reason. Right. You better be able to explain. The dollar amount was way more than the other guys. Well, Aponte was $14,000. It's $14,000, but Gordon Fox stole almost 100 right. Okay, And he was convicted of a felony for not only the campaign expenses, but for taking a bribe. So not the same case, right? So at the end of the day, on Aponte, there were two things that were important to me. This guy wasn't going to jail. I can get up and jump up and down, Bob, all day long and say, put him in jail. Judge isn't putting him there, whether I go to trial or not. Right. And I don't get to go to trial. If, I, if he wants to plead, he can plead. That's the way the system works. Well, that's the way, especially how the, the, the feds work. It, look, when, when you're a defendant and you want to plead guilty, right. you walk into court and you plead guilty. So on the federal side, you file what's called a notice of intent to plead guilty. Prosecutor gets a copy of it, right? They file it with a court. You walk in and you plead guilty, and the judge gives you whatever the judge wants Feels to give you. Like, yeah. That's the way it works. Right. So prosecutors don't get to say, look, I'm going to trial no matter what the defendant and the judge want. So to me, what was important was that this guy be convicted of a felony. Why? Why is a felony so important? It's important for this reason. It's important because if you're convicted of a felony... You can't run for office. You yeah. can't run for office, right? And the other thing is, the other thing that was important to me is that he resigned right now. Why is that important? Let's say, let's say he doesn't plead and we go to trial and he's convicted. Then he appeals. Well, he's not officially convicted right. until his appeal runs. Right. He's still on the council two years from now. Right. Two years from now, he's still on the council. And we're still asking these questions. Questions that I got asked uh, on the campaign trail, questions I got asked when I was in office. Why is Mr. Aponte still on the council? Right? I wanted him off the council and I wanted to make sure he didn't run again anytime soon. And so those were the two things that were most important to me. Because as I said, there's another instance where somebody, no disrespect to that person, he pled to a misdemeanor, he's still serving. Right? I knew that with this result... That was in Bristol, wasn't it? The other one? No, that was, Ray Gant that was Mr. Gallison. I'm speaking of another state rep. But the point, the point with Mr. Ponte was is, if he's convicted of a felony, he resigns right away. Right. That was, I insisted on that. And He's not going to run again anytime soon. Providence has a new day going forward, um, and I thought that was the right result. And I would do it again. I think it was the right thing to do. Now, you, you mentioned once you are convicted of a felony, I do know that, that you're not able to run, but what happened with Buddy Cianti? Why you well, so what happens is you can't run. <laughs> well, it was funny you say, asked that question, but I was just spot on, <laughs> because it's called the Buddy Rule. That's called the Buddy I Rule, know. right? The Buddy Rule <laughs> is how many years after you finish your probation can you run, right. right? So you've got to complete your probation. That's why we wanted five years. We wanted as long as possible. Right. The only other person who's been, who's been sentenced like this is a fellow who got three years, right? I wanted as long as possible and then tack three years on top of that. So that takes Mr. Pani, as I read, as I read the law, uh, out yes. of the game for eight years. And that's a long time to be out of the game. It takes us past a, a mayoral election, for example. Um, and so that was what was critical for me, that Providence has a chance to reset, move forward. Mr. Pawnee's out of the game, now and for the foreseeable future. And again, in particular now, the longer he serves on the council with this cloud, it's bad for the council, it's bad for the people of Providence. Right. And as Providence goes, so goes the state. And so I felt that this was the most important thing that we do. Get him out, get him out of office right away and make sure he can't come back anytime soon. Uh, you also dealt with the uh, Diocese of Providence. Mm-hmm. And where do we go with that? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> because it's ongoing, I, I, can't, I can't get into too much detail, but here's what I'm trying to accomplish there. Look, I want to understand, um, I'm not interested in having the diocese tell me what happened. Right. I want to know from a prosecutor's perspective what happened. And how will you gain that by your own? Yeah. Investigation. Yeah. So, so what we're doing is a review of, in the first instance, records. Now, we're going to obviously speak to witnesses at some point, but the first thing is to gather all the information. Right. You you can't decide what you're going to do legally until you have all the information you right. need. And so we're getting that information, at the moment, by getting access to church files on a voluntary basis. That was the memorandum of understanding we signed with the church last week. Why did I do it that way? I did it that way because. Without getting into this case in particular, there's another way to get information. As a prosecutor, we almost always get our information through the grand jury. But as soon as you use the grand jury, you saw this in 38 Studios, everything is secret, right? Nothing, right. Can, right? right? Unless you indict somebody, right, nothing comes out. So 38 Studios, grand jury process was used totally appropriately. But at the end of the day, no indictments. Again, no reason to dispute that result. Right. But the information cannot be released. Forever? Forever. That's what the law says. The law is very clear. So we can on that never part. find out about you, 38 students. Well, you won't get not this way. 
Now, you might get it from oversight hearings from the General Assembly if they have the inclination to do that, but you'll never get it from the grand jury. A, a grand jury, the criminal justice system, is not the mechanism to put a spotlight on something. Right. It's a mechanism to charge somebody with a crime. Sometimes along the way of charging people with a crime and prosecuting them for a crime, information comes out. But it's not a vehicle for exposing stuff generally. So, back to the church. I know the interest in this issue, and I understand it. And I understand victims are hurt. And so I want to be able to share as much as I can. I know that if in the first instance I use the grand jury process, what I'm going to be able to say at the end of the day may be starkly limited. Right. Take, for example, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania identified 300 priests that engaged in misconduct. They only uh, indicted three people. The reason we know about wow. the 300, the only reason we know about the 300 is because in Pennsylvania you can do a grand jury report. Whether you indict somebody or not, that's not the law in Rhode Island. I try to get that law changed. I'm a, I, I, I believe this, Bob, that if... I see a problem, and I know that there's a solution, and it's incumbent on me to try to fix it. I can't sure. just say, I got a problem, right. I'm going home. All right, here's a problem, I need to try to fix it. So we put in legislation that would allow us to do that kind of report. And I respect views at the General Assembly and elsewhere that think that that's not the greatest idea. I think it was, and so right. I put it in. We weren't successful getting that done. So well, now that's that, what Pennsylvania does. That's what Pennsylvania does. So now that I know that I can't do it like Pennsylvania, right? Because right? if, if, if I'm in Pennsylvania, if Pennsylvania has the same law that we have, when that investigation's over, the answer is there were three priests that engaged in misconduct, because that's all they can say, the only ones who were indicted. So if I want to do this differently, wow. then I've got to approach it differently. And the way I have to approach it is get as much information as I can voluntarily. So in the first instance, we're going to get as much information as we can voluntarily and see where that takes us. And look, the diocese, um, I can only take them at their word. They're going to give us access to all their files. We'll see how it goes. What have you, what have you gotten from uh, people now that you're the attorney general, um, as far as your predecessor is concerned, mm -hmm. uh, to look back at your you versus your mm -hmm. predecessor. What do you think the, uh, the atmosphere is in the, in the AG's office? Inside the office, you mean? Yeah. You know, it's hard to tell not having, not having been there. You know, I, I brought in sort of a new management team, as, as, uh, as Attorney General Kilmartin did, and as Attorney General Lynch did, Attorney General Whitehouse did. So you always bring in your own team at the top. You know, I sort of recruited sure. you know, my deputy attorney general, head of the criminal division, people I'd worked with in the Justice Department for 15 years. Deputy Attorney General is a D. Goldstein. She's great. Steve Danbrook is a criminal chief. He's great. But I worked with them in the Justice Department, the U.S. Attorney's Office, for 15 years. I trust them. That's who you want next to you. Yeah, look, when you're in a foxhole, you want to know who's standing next to That's you. That's right. And, right? And so, and there are people, when I was making decisions in the U.S. Attorney's Office about the Google case, that big $500 million case we brought against Google, involving Gordon Fox or Ray Gallison or Mayor Moreau or the North Providence Town Councilors, when we were doing big cases, there were three people in the room. It was me, D. Goldstein, and Steve Demerick. And so they're with me now, and I have great confidence in them. So that's helped. And we've recruited other people around that top executive team that are doing a great job. My sense, and I don't know that it's different, my sense is that people in the office are... Um, are uh, having a good experience. I know this, they're working really hard and they're working really well. You know, we had these cases in the office that needed, we needed to work through this backlog of cases, 1,600 yeah, what was, cases. Yeah, what's with that? Yeah, those were, those were cases, Bob, that, that just because there weren't enough people in that unit, that screening unit, that intake unit where cases get their start, if right. you will, felony cases, right. it just wasn't, the office only has so many staff and you're constantly moving them to sort of shore up areas where they need help. The reality was... So that wasn't his fault then? Oh, you know, look, Attorney General Comartin, once it, once it got on his radar screen, was actively trying to fix it. There's, yeah. there's no doubt in my mind. And, and, and look, it happens... I can see times over the course of my, over my tenure where something, I don't want to say similar can happen, but if you're not keeping an eye, you're fixing this problem, and this problem pops up over here. Right. You're fixing that problem, this problem up happens over here. It's going to happen. It's happened on every attorney general's watch. What I'm concerned about is we had these cases, and we had to get it fixed. Because if we didn't get this fixed, those cases are just going to linger. Right? That means victims are not getting justice. These right. defendants aren't getting justice because their case is lagging. And here's the most important thing. Those cases can be dismissed by the district I, court I was going to say that. in six months. Right. And what happens if they get dismissed is if you have a no-contact order, Right, you know, it's a it's a it's a felony domestic assault, right. serious bodily injury with a weapon that goes away, right? That the goes away if there are, if there are conditions of bail. You need alcohol counseling or substance abuse counseling, or you need anger management counseling. Those all go away. So we had to move those cases very quickly, and I'm pleased to say that we are here. We are about you know about seven months out 
that that backlog is almost all gone. Really? Yes. The 1,200 cases? Well, 1,697. Oh, 1,600? 1,697. It's a number that I wow. will remember. Wow. And, and 1,697. Well, you only understand your issue if you know what it is. So what I asked our people to do, Susan Urso is doing a great job in that unit. I asked her to go back and count. Tell me as of January 1, how many cases fit into this category? Cases that are over six months old, three, six, uh, six, over six months old, over three months old, um, and then zero to three months. So the problem with those cases was about 500 were over six months old. The remainder were between zero and six, but they weren't moving. They were just sitting on a shelf, right. and they were going to be over six months old. And so she's done a great job with her team of getting that number down. And we took, that, that unit had seven employees in it. I increased it to 13. I didn't go out and add positions to the overall unit. We only got 237 at the time positions, but I pulled them in from other places because I knew that was a priority. And so we've got, we've got that under control and, uh, and we'll, we'll see where we go from here. But it's a good example of how hard people are working. I'll give you, I'll give you one example. And look, they're, they're not asking for thanks. My employees are not asking for thanks. They're working hard, but they're not looking for, for kudos. But I'll tell you this, in April, they came in four Saturdays in a row. They don't get wow. paid overtime. Right. Uh, they came in four Saturdays in a row for a couple of pizzas that we picked up for them to make a dent in this backlog. And I'll never forget that. You know, for as long as I serve in the office, that's I'll never quite I'll, unusual. I'll never forget the commitment from that group of men and women. And that's not lawyers. Some of it's lawyers, right. but that's 10, 13 men and women, professional support staff that are working hard for the people of the state. And right. all they their only reason they're doing it is for a slice of pizza. I'm just going right? to for, pizza, for a slice pizza. of pizza. <laughs> and because they know it's important, right? They know it's important. So, and I, and I, I, have, I have an incredible affection for them as a result and admiration for them. I, so, so is it like every day I can picture you every day walking in the office and somebody saying to you, we only got 938 left. Well, I went, I went to my friend Sue Worsley the other day. I said, what's the count? She said, it's 180. This is a couple of weeks. Actually, it was July 1st. She said, 187, she said, on July 1st. It is left? Is left. From 1697. Yeah. And so I went down a couple of days ago. Wow. I said, what's the count? She said, well, we're really not counting anymore because I don't think it's really an issue. There's probably still a few stragglers that we're still cleaning up. I think we'll be, I think we'll be at dead zero within a week or two. Wow. I'm really proud of their work. That's, and I tell you, that's that, quite they, impressive. They're invigorated and they're working hard. Um, I, I try to poke my head in there every once in a while because, look, they, they, were, you know, they were under siege. When I first got here, you know, got to the office, when you walked into that group, they were, they were you know, the tensions were high, right? They knew, they knew they were under some public scrutiny um, and they didn't have the resources they needed to get the job done. And, and they're doing a great job now. Really proud of them. Really am. Well, what did we got? I, we're going to try something new here. I've never done this before. You're, You're the, asking me to put a hand in a box in and pull box. something out? Go ahead. That's a, that's, a Go ahead. that's a dangerous game. That's a, it sure is. It sure, you're the guy to do it with, though. <laughs> All right. Here we go. What do we got? All right. What do we have? This is out of the box. This is a, a, a new... Ah, this is it. Too lenient on politicians. <laughs> oh, you already got it. You I already, already got, got it. it. All right. right. Then grab another try, one. Want to try another one? I dispute that, by the way. Um, okay. Let's see. So these are questions. Yeah. Democrats' big ideas may reelect Trump. Yeah. So, so as I take that, it's are Democrats um, not focused enough to give the electorate an alternative to what we have right now? You know, I don't spend a lot of time in this job thinking about politics. Right. I certainly don't think that about them locally. That was probably a tough question for you. you know? Not a good question, I should say, for you to yeah. ask you. But so I, I try, you know, I, because I think, look, I, I represent all the people of the state. I got to achieve justice for right, all of them, right. Democrat, Republican, Well, that's why I said that. Whoever, probably right? not a good question right? for you. Um, but, and I'm no, God knows, I'm no political expert. This is, this is my first run for office. And so, you know, um, I was a little green when I started down this path, <laughs> unlike some of my veterans, uh, colleagues that are veterans in terms of politics. But I will say, I think it's true, whether you're, you know, given whoever's in, the, whoever's in office, whoever's running against the president uh, in office, you got to have a consistent message that resonates with enough people that you can get elected. Right. And look, but but look, Democrats are. This is the sorting out process. Republicans went through the same thing four years ago. Yeah. I mean, they you know looked at the stage back in whatever it was the year before twenty so twenty fifteen. There were eight guys up there, eight women up there, men and women, and you know half of them you, you hadn't heard of. And you know, some will emerge. There'll be a core group that'll come out, and we'll see where it takes us. But what I, I guess I'm saying is how, how they are, you know, they're shifting the, the Democratic Party a little. 
to well, the left. Well, you know, look. A much to the left. Well, look, and the same thing's happening in the Republican Party, right? Yeah, it's going the other way. Right, yeah. so, so, right. I, look, I think the, what I've always tried to do personally when it comes to issues is um, I, 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 talk, I try not to think of sort of the national labels of what being a Democrat means, um, although my values are consistent with the Democratic values writ large. I'm pro-choice, for example. Um, uh, I do believe that everybody should have health care. I'm not sure that Medicaid for all is the answer, but I do think that everybody should have health care. As, as, as married to a doctor who treats patients every day, you know, if you don't have health care, you're going to the ER. Getting, getting health care in the ER is the most expensive way you can get exactly. it. Right? Exactly. We want people covered to save money. Look, doctors can't turn away people in the ER. Right. You can't say you don't have insurance, I'm not treating you. Right. That, you cannot do that. They're getting treated. So we have to come up with a way to give everybody health care because that's going to save us money. We're going to have a healthier population. It's the right thing to do. But even if you only think about the economics, we're going to save money in the long run. So, so, we've, that, so that's one of my core values. But, you know, in terms of how the party moves, you know, look, I was in, when I was running, one of my concerns was that, look, I've been in law enforcement for 20 years. Um, you, know, you know, we've done some tough cases. We've done some big corruption cases. We've done some big... Uh, violent crime cases, we've done some big drug sweeps, gun sweeps, whatever. What concerned me was that somehow I would be viewed as somebody um, who, who could not adjust to the times, right? Who didn't believe what in alternative. We well, so, so we can't put everybody in prison, right? We, gotta, right. we, we can't focus on everybody, right? We, we're doing, the number of cases we're doing a year, Bob, is off the charts. In fact, we, we've just loaded 1,697 cases into the system. We're way ahead because of that, wow. our pace from last year. We're, we're, we're approaching 4,000 cases for the year. We are normally, round numbers, four to 5,000 in a given year. So we're busier already, and we're and adding- half of the year. And we're adding another 1697 into the mix because they weren't there, right? So we're adding into already what's right. a busy year. Right. I've got 70 prosecutors. If you do the math, they cannot, they've got to prioritize, right? So we've got to figure out who's driving our violent crime problem. Who are the significant drug traffickers? Who are the most significant people engaged in public corruption, right? Who are the ones who are driving the big uh, fraud schemes? Priorities, it's called. You got to exactly, Bob. You get it, right? And so you can't you can't treat everybody the same way, right? You've got to prioritize. So what are my priorities? Public corruption, wage theft, the underground economy, environmental enforcement, significant violent crime, um, any kind of violent crime, but particularly people who really drive violent crime, the shooters out there, right? right? Uh, significant drug trafficking, and then there's the people who fall into the other categories, small scale. Small, look, to a victim, big deal, and we want to achieve justice for a victim. Right. People who possess drugs rather than deal them, okay? Somebody, an 18-year-old who steals a car on a joyride, ride, should pay restitution, right? Do community service. But if we can get these, these young people in particular, nonviolent offenders. Get them back in, on the straight and narrow. Get them into diversion, right? And then, get them, and then get them back into society in a way that that felony conviction doesn't hang around their heads. I mean, it actually is interesting in the context of a Ponte, right? A lot of the work we're doing in criminal justice reform is around, if you don't warrant a felony conviction, don't give it to somebody, because that felony conviction can't get public housing, right? right? Can't get financial aid, right? can't get a job. Yep. Lots of barriers to getting back on your feet, right? That's why we, our drug reclassification bill to make simple possession of narcotics or personal use misdemeanors or felony, that's why that was so important. So to me, a felony conviction, whether you go to jail or not, it's is a, a tag. big... It's a lifetime tag. Oh, it's a big almost, deal. Right? It's almost sure. a lifetime tag. Sure. What did they say about Buddy Sancy, speaking of him? Convicted felon. Right. Convicted felon. Right. Now, he managed to get himself a radio gig. But, but the vast majority of people who are convicted felons have a hard time. And look, you got to pay the piper. And I have no sympathy for public officials in particular who raise their right hand, take an oath to do the right thing and don't do it. But for uh, a young person who's made a mistake and can fix it and get us reset, we need to be doing that. So I need my prosecutors focused on the worst of the worst. Right? The perpetuals. Sure. And we know who they are. Right? If you come to Pawtucket or you go to Providence, they can tell you who drives violent crime. They, they know who the shooters are because, because they either shot somebody in the past or they've got it. They, we know who they are. We can focus our efforts on them. So, so back to what I was saying about sort of um, about when I was running for office, I needed to make it plain that the way I view the criminal justice system is not hit everybody with the hardest thing all the time. That doesn't make sense from an economic perspective and doesn't make sense from a justice perspective. It's a lot harder to be thoughtful about what you're doing Everybody wants you to bang everybody all the time, right? <laughs> everybody wants everybody to go to jail all the time. You want to be a successful prosecutor politically? Hammer everybody all the time. 
But I don't think that's right, and I don't think that's justice, and I don't think it's smart, and I don't, and I think it wastes money. And so, being thoughtful is harder, Bob. But I think it's a smart and right thing to do. And that's what we did, frankly, in the Obama administration. We really made, I think, great strides in criminal justice there. And I hope someday to be to be back there again nationally. But that's what we're trying to do here in Rhode Island. Well, you're in the box. Another another question. We'll see which one I we'll see which one I get this time. <laughs> See if you get a good one, will you? Yeah, let's, let's try to pull a good one out. You can see I don't win many raffles here. No, I guess not. All right. Round Student Loan Bill of Rights created. Yeah, that's a good one. So that was great legislation, which um, uh, Representative McNamara, Chairman McNamara, yep. um, Senator Oyer. He's from Warwick, right? He's from Warwick, yeah. He's he's actually, he's the, uh, the head of the Democratic Party. Head of the Democratic Party, Party yep. And uh, Senator Oyer from down in my neck of the woods, Newport, Jamestown, and others. Um, uh, endorsed, uh, sponsored, uh, the, uh, the general treasurer and I right. worked together on that. It goes back to the student loan issue we're talking exactly. about, right? Exactly, yeah. So if you, if you um, the issue here is that you have student loans, you're paying them back. The student loan services are not necessarily the places from whom you got your loans. So you might go down. Oh, they sold them. For, they sold Correct. them to other companies. Correct. And look, sometimes you get a house mortgage. And, you know, you run into the same problem. Right. They don't apply the payments the right way. They make mistakes. And at the end of the day, you owe more money than you should. Right. Or in, in some instances, under these public interest student loan programs, if you work for 10 years and you pay a portion of your income, your other indebtedness go away. Right. We've had many instances, we've seen this here and across the country, where those services are not doing a good job. And they're either, in some instances, they're misleading borrowers. You know, well, cut your rates, you know, cut your payments. But they're extending the period of time right. over which they pay. And they're paying a lot more in the long run. Or they're not applying the payments the right way. And as a result, consumers, student loan borrowers, are being harmed. And so what this bill does is it makes sure that when loan services do that, it violates what's called the Rhode Island Deceptive Trade Practices Act, which is otherwise very weak. I mean, this is really a fix to that statute in one particular is area. Is that part of the usury? No, was? no, no. There's, there's something huh. called the Rhode Island Deceptive Trade Practices Act. And what that does is if you are an entity, typically a business, but not necessarily so. It could be a college or it could be anything, really. If you're engaged in a deceptive or, or uh, unfair trade practice, really, it's a consumer right. protection statute. And it's, it's pretty universal. There's a version of it in every state. Ours just happens to be very weak. And it's weak. It is, absolutely. Oh, weak. I've, it, always, I've always thought about that. If I had a dream job, it would be to be in your office. Not, yeah. not your job, but be in your office as the consumer protection. Yeah. Because I, I really irritates the heck out of sure. me when you see all, this, all these scams that people right. pull on people. And here's the problem with our law. Here's the problem with our law. And I'm glad you asked the question. The problem with the law is if you're a regulated industry, I know the lieutenant governor's run into this with his, as he's targeted electric companies. If you're a regulated industry, so what does that mean? A bank, an insurance company, uh, public utility, utility. health care, uh, dental, dental, dentist, anybody who's regulated by a state or federal agency, stockbroker, um, financial planner, if you do something that is unfair or deceptive, you lie to the public or oh, to an individual. Well, everybody you mentioned has a license. They do, and they're, right, and they're regulated by somebody else, DBR, Office of the Health Commissioner, FTC, uh, SEC. If you're regulated by those industries, and it's not criminal conduct, we can't go after them civilly to make them stop, right? The AG in Rhode Island, unlike in Massachusetts, unlike in almost every other state, with the possible exception of Michigan, can't do, cannot, cannot do it. Oh. So, so how do these cases start? We would issue a, what's called a civil investigation demand. This is not criminal. This is civil. It's to make them stop doing what they're doing and pay restitution. We would issue what's called a civil investigative demand. If you're in one of those regulated industries, they can file what's ca called a motion to, to quash and just say, look, we don't have to give you the stuff because we're a regulated industry. That's DBR's job. Wow. Now, look, no disrespect to another state agency or another federal agency. I believe the people of the state uh, want their attorney general to act on their behalf. Right. Uh, that's, that's why we're here. We're the people's right. lawyer. I've never had a private client in the state of Rhode Island. Never. I had a private client in Massachusetts, but since I've been back in the state of Rhode Island, I've only worked for the public. I want to be, and we should be, the people's lawyer. And we can't do that if we don't have this tool in the toolbox. And so the student loan bill fixes that for student loan services. Oh, good. We need a broader fix. Exactly. And, and this yeah. goes back to what we were talking about earlier. If I see a problem, 
I believe I need to do more than just say we got a problem. I got to propose a fix. We proposed a fix in this legislative session. The Senate passed it. The House did not take it up. We're going to be back next year trying to get it and get it passed because we can do a lot of great work, and we're doing a lot of great work. If you think about the ticket uh, specul speculators uh, case that we brought, Remember, I don't know if you read about it, but um, these online ticket brokers were selling tickets oh, yeah. online to Hamilton, right. and they were right. they, they were basically. I don't want to call them fake tickets, but they didn't have the tickets they said they were selling. Yeah. They would have to go online and try to get them. And customers being overcharged for something that well, they didn't have. Well, you got a lot of people's have. money back. We did. You? We did. And we got 4,000 speculative tickets taken down from, that were being sold right. online. We d I did that because it was important to do it. But that's an example of the kind of work we can do for non-consumers. We could do it there because they're not a regulated industry. There's no reason we shouldn't be doing that. In With all re Absolutely. even regulated industries. Absolutely. Right? That's what we do. Um, we have a great team that's ready to do it. I have great lawyers and a great consumer investigative unit. There's eight people who work there. I sign letters to consumers multiple times a week. You know, yeah. you know $2,000 refund for that. You know, one person, $100 gift card. But to that person, you know, company, you know, business, well, the restaurant goes out of business. Well, you're doing your job. Business goes out, you know, business, the restaurant goes out of business. That person has a $100 gift right. card. Well, they want their $100. Well, that happened in Smithfield right? with a bunch of people, right? So we're helping people $25 at a time. Sometimes it's in the thousands. We can do a lot more there, but we need the law to measure up to other laws around right. the country. And right. so we're going to get there. I mean, you know, we had good conversations this year. I think we'll get there next year. Well, when I used to think about uh, high interest, I used to think about... Uh, on the hill or uh, the, the mob uh, charging high interest rates, yeah, like, usury, like a, yeah, like a yeah. shock. What, yeah, what do they yeah, call it? Loan shock. Yeah, loan right? shark, yeah. The usury loss, yeah, exactly, right? Exactly, right. Why is it why is it that I put money in the bank, I can't get two percent interest, but they can get up to thirty three percent on a credit card. Yeah. I, I don't understand yeah, that. Yeah, there's that and look you know, look, you know, payday lending is something that concerns me, you know. Well that's even worse, payday yeah, lending. Right, yeah. Look and and I don't buy the argument that people wouldn't have anywhere else to go. I don't buy that argument. I mean that's something that's on my radar screen, you know, for next year, frankly. Um because that payday lending, lending could be hundreds of sure. percent. Sure, it really, really victimizes people who don't have a lot of means. I'm really concerned about that. But even, even 33% on a Visa or a MasterCard is, re, is re crazy. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and, well, the other thing, too, right, is if, you're, you know, if, if you're, not in, you're not in a position to pay that credit card off every month, right, you know, then you go into that, that huge percentage interest hall. Yeah, look, I think that's, that's, those are some of the reforms that... Um, among others, Elizabeth Warren has been trying to advocate for. Right. Um, but that's not where you want to be. Uh, but look, a lot of people have to do that. You know, there are people who can take out a home equity loan because they own their home. Right. A lot of people don't own their homes. Yeah, but I can remember in my 20s, 20s, 30 years old, I could get a credit card at 7 or 8%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when it was 15% to get a mortgage. I know it. I remember those days, yeah. I was right out of law school and and, and mortgage rates were in the teens. It's incredible to think I, of today. Fifteen and a half, my first mortgage. Yeah, rate. yeah, yeah. It's probably sometime what in the late eighties, seventies. Um, yeah, seventies. Yeah, and they were still in the teens when I got to law school in the late eighties. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's only in recent memory they've come down. Look, you know, but our job in the consumer unit is to make sure that 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 entities, businesses, are not taking advantage of the person who can't otherwise seek justice. Right? Here's why. For your, your average person to go hire a lawyer for a hundred dollar gift card, right? Right. It's a, forget it. Forget it. Makes just, no sense. Just throw it away. Right. So we're helping people. They're not not always big amounts. Some of them are. Some of them are. One was, I think, one for a hearing aid manufacturer was like two twenty three hundred dollars. I'm sure that person was really grateful to get that money back. But sometimes it's a hundred dollars or twenty five dollars. Sometimes it's just clearing somebody's credit report because it wasn't, right. wasn't doesn't handle fairly. But to those individuals, that means a lot. And you know, our staff is doing a great job, and I love signing those letters. I'm not doing anything in those cases, but my team's doing a great job. And I love being able to sign those letters because I see what we're doing in a very real way. Right. You know, we impact people through our consumer unit, I bet, every bit as much as we do through the criminal justice no system. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt in my mind. All right. Here you go. Another one, huh? Come on. Get in there. I got your questions here, too, but I like mine. All right, wrong prices charged at supermarkets. Huh. Oh, my God, does that happen all the time. So what, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. You go through the scanner with your, yeah. with your goods. It happened to me today. Really? And, and I did that a week, couple yours. weeks ago. But yeah, is, that, I, is that your question? That, that's mine. But I did that over a week ago, and it happened again today. I was in a supermarket today, and I scanned an item. There's a big sign there, uh, uh, 
four dollars off uh, instead of seven ninety nine it's three ninety nine so I grab this item and I bring it to the register and they scan it seven ninety nine I go no it's three ninety nine oh no it's seven ninety nine no it's three ninety nine really yeah. I'll have to. I'll, you'll have to go back and see whether we've gotten complaints about that. I had not heard that one. That happens that. very often to a lot of people. people now, when I go, I do self checkout, Bob, so I see it. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah. I'm seeing it when I'm ringing it up. Uh, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, right? That sometimes you just kind of you don't, don't. When I get home, I just kind of want to be in my own, my yep. own space. Yep. So that's why I do self checkout. Well, I do self checkout sometimes, but then I think of the of the, the people that are working. I know. There, I know. I, 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 I know. You want to make sure they. Right? I want to keep I know. them. Employed. I know. I know. So I, I go to the checkout lane whenever possible. That's true. And I said to the lady, and she didn't want to hear it. I said, no, that's three ninety nine. I said, I wouldn't have bought it at seven ninety nine. Right. I only bought well, it. Well, what do they do? Did they fix it for you? No, they told me they were going to send somebody up to the other Lot, end of the aisle place. 19. I said, look, I don't have time. I said, I got to go. Just take it off the, right. the bill. Now they have to have a woman come over and or a, a manager or whatever. And uh, it was a woman. Come over and... Uh, uh, key the register and change, take right. the number off, take it off my credit card. I had a sign for it. By that time, they could have went and. and well, you know, you know what's interesting about that. I mean, that you know, that's a great, it's a great example of. Um, it's a great example of, um, scope of liability, right? So when you're looking at a case, and this, this comes up in sometimes it comes up in in, in sort of low level, election, matters. It can be civil or criminal. Same thing is true with Medicaid fraud. It can be civil or criminal. Right. And so what you're looking at in those cases, so if somebody, for example, overcodes, right? They don't code the same way as they used to, but you know, for a particular issue, you know, you're coding a three and you get more money if you code a five. So they'll code a five and it really should be a three. The question is, is it deliberate right. or is it careless? And so in this issue, I'm going to take it back. Cause I, I, you know, so what do we do in the consumer unit? How do, we, how do we figure some of that out? I asked them to run for me. How many complaints have we had? What are our top five, ten entities that have been complained about, right? So you get a sense of whether there's a pattern. Now you pick a big utility, and you're going to get a lot of complaints, sure. right? Everybody's got Verizon well, first or AT&T. Well, it's big money. It's bigger money. Well, sure. and, and everybody's got them. Everybody's got AT&T or Verizon or Sprint. So they're going to, but you, you kind of adjust for them. You know, now you're looking at you know, a restaurant or a gym or. Uh, a wedding, God, we get a lot of complaints about wedding photographers. Oh, and if, and oh if you, really? And if you're, getting, if, if you're getting 10 complaints about the same wedding photographer, well, then maybe you got an issue, right? right? Then, right. It's, then it's not, hey, good, maybe the guy didn't deliver them on time. Right. There's something else going on here. So that's part of the analysis we go through when we're trying to figure out how to prioritize what we're doing. But I'll take that one back and take a look. I'm and I, maybe you. I need to check, A, maybe I need to spend a little more time with the cash you gotta registers. Go the and I gotta go through the drive through Gotta go through the, uh, the line there. Correct, yeah, yeah the take, a, take line. a closer look, yeah. Pick again. All right, let's see what we got here. We're, we're going through, this is something I'm trying new, out of the box, folks. And the, the Attorney General is gonna be the first one to actually go through this. Go what through it, an education horror show. So this is the Providence School issue. Oh, yes. Yeah, so look, heartbreaking, right, for kids, you know. You, sometimes you get caught up in the, we talk a lot about the administrators and we talk about the teachers and, and the buildings, but ultimately it's about the kids, right? And, and uh, you know, that's not an issue that my office deals with. No, I know that. But, um, but as a citizen and as a parent of two boys, uh, who had the good fortune to grow up in a, in a place where the schools were, were in good shape. And although the Jamestown school my kids went to was exactly what I went through. But it was good shape. It was maintained. Right. It's heartbreaking to see kids learn in that environment. Look, for some kids, it's harder than others. Just if everybody's in a, in a wonderfully uh, maintained school system with small class sizes, uh, it's a hard time in your life. You know, you're a teenager. We all kind of remember that. Again, I raised two boys. To put any other obstacles in the way of a child, um, it's heartbreaking. I mean, you know, look, I don't. We're we're not going to have a strong economy in Rhode Island if our kids aren't educated and educated well. And again, as I said earlier, as Providence goes, so goes so Rhode goes Island. So goes the rest of the state. So we got to get a handle on that. It's not my bailiwick. Happy to help any way that I can if anyone reached out to me. And I spent some time there. I talked to kids in the Providence schools. It's not lost on me the conditions they were in. And I was in a, I was in a school in Providence. I don't know, five, four or five years ago talking to kids. And I remember seeing a curtain. I, I, this stays with me. There's a teacher, great a teacher. A curtain? A curtain, like a, like a curtain, like behind a, a stage, like, yep. one, like a big performance curtain. Sure. At the top of the curtain it said asbestos. And it did not say asbestos, warning asbestos. 
it was saying asbestos, this curtain is made of asbestos, it's fireproof, what a great curtain I have. Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute, okay? Woven into the actual curtain, it, it said asbestos <laughs> as a badge of honor, okay? Kids are learning in so that So that curtain's gotta be 30 years old. Absolutely. Kids are learning in that environment, paint coming off the ceilings. Look, you know, I know Providence has a lot of challenges, but this is really incumbent on all of us as citizens. Uh, to talk about this and hopefully find a solution because we've got to educate our kids. And look, it's not just about our economy, it's about our criminal justice system too. That's how it intersects with me, I guess, in, in, in ways. I mean, too many of our defendants are young people. Uh, I remember when I was running for office, I sat with a group of young people at the Institute for the Study of Practice of Nonviolence and I asked them, and they'd all had contact with the criminal justice system. They were young, 18, 19, 20, 21. Sure. And, and I didn't want to make it about them. So I said, look, if you had a younger sibling or younger brother, and you were worried about them, what would you tell me or what would you tell them as a way to make sure they don't end up where you are? Because they're having a hard time now, right? These are convicted felons yep. trying to get back on their feet at 19. Really hard. What would you say to, your, to me or to, to your siblings? Have a place where they can go do something after school, right? Make sure the Boys and Girls Clubs are Keep open. Keep them occupied. Keep them occupied, right? I remember being on the south side of Providence at the Juan Pablo Duarte Center, and I was speaking to a community there, a community group. I went downstairs probably six o'clock, five o'clock, whatever it was. And there were some community volunteers with young, young, young women, young girls, teaching dance. Right? This is what we need to do. Right. right. For every kid in Providence. And there's some great groups doing it. PASA, the Providence After School Alliance, great programs for kids. Uh, we need to keep kids occupied. We need to keep them engaged. We need to keep them interested and give them something to live for, frankly, Bob. Right. And I think there's a lot of kids in Providence that don't see that plan. We were talking about it earlier, our kids going to law school. Sure. They don't see the plan in high school. They don't see the plan post high school. And we've got to give them hope for a future that is something other than what a lot of them see. Now many, many rise above it. Many are able to work through in spite the of challenge, it. in spite of it. And, and, and you know, what great courage uh, and, and, uh, uh, to be able to do that. But we've got to, everybody, every kid's got to have, a, got to have a, a baseline of a chance. And I don't know that we're doing that. In fact, I'm confident we're not doing that right now. And I hope that our state's leaders uh, will we'll get us headed in the right direction. And look, I'm, as I said, I'm happy to help any way that I can. It's not strictly within my portfolio, right. but, but it's not like I don't think about it. That makes sense. Listen, uh, we talked enough about serious stuff. Now, have you had any fun over there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, look, I, I try to get around and see my team. You know, I go over to the courthouse. I love watching them do the work that they do. You know, crazy. Do you grade them? Do you sit no. there? I mean, no, you, you don't grade them. No, but it's funny you say that. So <laughs> it's funny you say that. So you know, you want to be the you want to be the guy who's interested in their work, right? You don't want them to think you don't care about what they're doing. Right. I want to know what they're doing. I'm interested in their work. I want to know if I can help them. So I'm over. I'm in the office maybe a month, and I walk and I don't know everybody yet. So I walk over there, and this young young uh, young uh, attorney, youngish attorney, uh, Jamal Burke is his name, fine attorney, and I walk in the Superior Court. It was Judge Rogers courtroom. I walk in there. I sit down in the audience. You know, trying to sneak in quietly. Turns out it was his first trial. He turned around and he saw me, and I guess. Oh no! You made him a wreck. You probably made him a wreck. Well, you know, wreck. he he did a great job. But somebody <laughs> said to me after June, you didn't do Jamal any favors by walking in there in his first Superior Court jury trial. So I try to walk that balance. But yeah, no, we're having we're having fun over there. Look, I I, I really. We're doing a lot of good things. Environmental enforcement. We are about to do some really good environmental enforcement work. And um, you can, can you tell me about it? Well, look, you know, I, I think if you go around the city, if you go along the waterfront, if you go elsewhere in the state, there are entities that are not doing things that they should. And when they do that, they have an advantage over the companies that are doing it the way they should. Environmental enforcement, consumer protection is not anti-business. There's some who say that. I reject that completely. Really? It's pro-business because if you're doing it, if you're in a business and you're doing it the right way, right, and somebody's doing it the wrong way, they've got an advantage over you. Right. They're saving money. Yeah, they're saving, saving, saving a lot right. of money. If you're not putting in what you need to protect the public environmentally, you're saving money because you're not putting that equipment in. So there's a lot of good work to do there yet, and I'm looking forward to getting that done. All right, you got 30 seconds. And, that, you're, and you've spent an hour. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed was it, it very was much. It that, was no, it that it's, difficult? No, it's great. No, I want to keep going back to the box. Look, no, I appreciate it. Appreciate Still got a few there, you know. I know. Maybe <laughs> we'll next time. We'll go the second hour. We'll save that for the second hour. Um, thanks for having me on. Look, it's been a great privilege for me to be in the office. Um, it, it's like coming home for me. People are enthused. I mean, I, the federal government, you know, we're so used to having all the resources that sometimes, myself included, we take those resources for granted. People in the AG's office um, never take anything for granted. They love their work, they work hard. You see the looks on their faces, they're heading over to quarters young people. I'm really proud of them and I'm really glad to be back.
Well, thank you for spending an hour with Bob. Yeah, Bob, thank you very much.